Brian Shelton, the co-founder and CEO of Botanicare. Really excited to have him back in our space in the atrium here at Enterprise Works. This is the building where the company launched, and now they're bigger and getting to the marketplace and really advancing their products, which we're going to hear more about today. But I think we'll hear more about the journey as well. And so this week is Startup Week. Starting a company is tough. Many of you are early stage startups that are in the room as well, and we hope you'll ask questions. Some of you are more mature. And each of those journeys is tough in each stage of the way. So you're not out of the woods yet, I'm sure, Ryan, and getting to all the dreams you have for the company. And each stage has its own um, obstacles that come with it and opportunities and reasons to celebrate as well. So we love to see companies go on beyond here and have continued success. And Ryan's going to be one of those examples of a company that started out of the University of Illinois with technology that was developed at the Beckman Institute. There's a faculty co-founder, and he'll maybe talk about the relationship of becoming then the first company employee and leader of the company from a postdoc environment to then CEO. And we've had two this week, so I hope you do talk about that uh, as your personal journey and how that's been to assemble a team. And now you've got more co-locations too. So, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ryan Shelton, the CEO of the podcast. I'll keep this mask off, but that's okay, I'll stay in the distance. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, my name is Ryan Shelton, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my story today, as well as uh, the Tonic Care story. Um, but, you know, I, I, I sent an email to Kathy uh, asking you know, kind of what should I cover today, and I didn't get a response, which to me is usually a blank check for whatever I want to talk about. So actually, most of the talk is going to be spent on how to optimize your cryptocurrency portfolio. I don't know how much interest we got in there, but you know, no paper hands. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I like that. We're going to go over to give Kathy our time mostly. So. I'm a pacer. I'm a pacer. This is going to be tough. I can move the plant. We can do this. There you go. All right. That should be okay. All right. So I'm going to put the clicker down. I'm going to talk for a little bit without changing slides and just talk a little bit about my background. Uh, and then we can get into uh, the time here and what we're doing there. So my, my start here. So a little of my background. I am an engineer by training. I have a, uh, I've got my Bachelor's in Electrical Engineering with a focus on optics and photonics from Oklahoma State University. Uh, as a senior design project there, I uh, was on a team with the very first biomedical focused electrical engineering professor, and our senior design project was uh, building a pulse oximeter. Nothing super innovative there. We probably could have gone to the store and you know, bought five different ones, but we built it from scratch, and that really opens uh, you know, me up to using lights in order to interrogate the body and medical applications. Now, very interesting to me. But all I had was one senior design project, so I knew I needed to learn more about it. So I looked for biomedical engineering programs. Oklahoma, where I grew up, didn't have any. So I went to Texas A&M. Uh, was an Aggie for a while. I managed to dodge fish camps. I didn't do the whole brainwashing thing. I don't know if there's any Aggies in the room, but. Um, Great, great experience. Uh, spent a lot of time um, on on imaging. So most of my background is in optical imaging. Did some stuff, uh, basically looking into tissue and, and you know imaging blood and other other parts of the human body that, that can provide value. And did a lot of animal work. Uh, after five years there and getting a PhD, I kind of the next thing I really wanted to understand is I've done a lot of base research, a lot of animal research. I uh, was really interested in how I could apply this in the clinic and get some translation experience. So I did a postdoc and I looked up and saw, you know, who's, who's one of the most prolific people in the world on optical imaging in the human body? And it's, he's right here at Beckman Institute. His name is Steve Bopart. So I came up and I did a postdoc with Steve. Um, I was focused on taking uh, technologies that are currently siloed in very expensive specialties like cardiology and ophthalmology and seeing how we can apply them to the rest of healthcare. And that's how my kind of postdoc got started. And so we, we, we found ways to make very expensive technology cheap, small, and, uh, and, and applicable in a lot of areas. Um, you know, example being primary care, going to your, your primary care doc or urgent care or any of these other areas in frontline care that 
can't afford to buy a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment in order to image the eye or the ear or anything like that. So that was a project I got started on. Um, we ended up uh, building some really cool stuff. Um, I started, uh, you know, investigating the ecosystem here, and that's really what got the company kicked off. So I was maybe in the first science cohort that we did here for I-Corp. Um, yes, it was. I think it was. It was the very first one we did here. Uh, it was one of the very first ones they did in the NSF. This was back in 2013, and uh, did a sites program uh, for, for NSF. You know, went out and, and did a bunch of customer discovery. If you guys, sure many of you are familiar with the i program, fantastic program for um, people coming out of academic uh, backgrounds that don't know anything about um, you know products and uh, and what it means uh, for customer demand and, and how features are different than value and that type of thing. So. Learned a ton there. Uh, ended up going on to the national program with this concept, which you know, concept that I'll talk about today. And what became Photonic Air is uh, is basically trying to provide clinicians a better way to diagnose and manage uh, middle ear infections, the most common uh, disease in children. So we went through the national ICO program, learned a bunch of stuff there, uh, changed the direction of the business, and uh, really got us kicked off here with some funding. I stepped out of the uh, postdoc role in 2015, uh, kind of raised two pools of money that year. One was uh, $250,000 seed rounds, um, mostly local investors, a couple of Chicago folks. And then uh, we won a we to phase two NIH award, which was about $1.5 So that was really uh, a good good way for us to kick off uh, the company. We were very fortunate to, to start that position. So then we started building. And um, we, you know, more or less built the wrong thing for two years and realized after two years that we built the wrong thing. Battery. Yeah, it's battery. I don't mind. The recording, if there's a recording, it's not going to record, I guess, but I don't mind talking about it. So we, um, yeah, so we spent, we spent a couple of years building the wrong thing. And, and what that was, was essentially we were focused on the wrong market. We focused on... Uh, the specialty. Um, even after you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we bring uh, you know specialty technology into primary care. We still were focused on a first product with the ENT, and uh, you know reasons for that. It's an easier market. It's, it's an easier market to go into. Any specialty is typically easier to access than uh, than kind of frontline care. So we learned from a bunch of customer discovery that the opportunity in frontline care was 10x bigger and the problem it was solving was far more acute than the one we'd be solving in specialty. So despite the challenges we knew were associated with that market, uh, we, we pivoted. And that was not just a strict market pivot, we, we had to basically overhaul the technology. So around 2017, we did a, a pretty hard pivot um, and, and spent the next you know, two years rebuilding and, and getting exactly what we thought the market you know, wanted. That was painful. My investors didn't like it, but it was absolutely the right move. Um, it, it positioned us much better for the future. It got us aligned a lot better with uh, various interests in the healthcare ecosystem. So it was the right move. Um, we, you know, then uh, uh, eventually got our FDA clearance. Uh, FDA clearance came in. Um, Basically, we announced it January 2020, and uh, we were placed in our first unit in March of 2020. Does that date rings a bell to anybody? Uh, the healthcare system basically exploded that month. Um, you know, I've got some slides to show earlier that, I think later that, that will help uh, hopefully that, some of that out. But more or less, um, you know, our entire market was either co opted for COVID response or sent home. So. It was, uh, it was a very interesting time for us. Uh, we immediately went into, uh, you know, we gotta get some money in the door, because there's no telling how long this is gonna last mode, and we raised some money. So we, uh, you know, that, that was, I think, a, a, a time of great learning for our team, uh, having, to, having to face something that, uh, you know, you don't know really what the outcome of this is gonna be. You know that everybody else is also freaking and how do you move forward? So I, I was early, early stages of a Series A around then. And more or less, you know, immediately sent an email to all the, all the investors that I've been talking to and said, look, you know, the game's changed. Here's the deal. We're going to cut this round in half. We're going to close it within three months. And here are the terms. 
Yeah, just to get movement because I needed something quick because I didn't couldn't tell the future. It just seemed like this would be bad. So that ended up working, and that was uh, that was something that, that I think you know our team was able to pull together. You know, reasonably large funding round. It was about five and a half million in uh, in twenty twenty, right at the height of the pandemic, and that's still something that uh, you know, we're very proud of as far as being able to uh, to persist in that environment. So. I'll run through a little bit about uh, you know why photonic here exists, and uh, I'll hop back over the slides. I want to give a little bit of a historical context. Um, the company was founded by myself, uh, Steve Bopark, who I mentioned earlier, who's still a professor at uh, the Beckman Institute, and Ryan Mullen, who was another uh, engineer in the lab uh, who's, who's now living in, uh, in North Carolina. So this is the product. It's um, it, you know it's, it's, it's a handheld device um, attached to a, a you know, console that's maybe the size of a thick laptop. We can mount it on a pole, we can put it on a wall, we can have it fully portable, it kind of depends on the clinic workflow. And what it is, is a device that can see through tissue. So we have a diagnostic platform specifically focused on frontline care. That was that big pivot that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we're beginning with ear health. So we use infrared light to look through tissue. In this case, we look through the eardrum to directly visualize what's in the middle ear. And uh, you know, why would we want to do that? So. There's 180 million ear exams each year in the U.S. alone. It is a ubiquitous exam. Every time you walk into the office, you know, you're going to get an ear exam. Um, within that, you know, we'll further segmenting that 120 dollars to $720 a day. It just, it's, a, it's a hugely common exam. Within that, uh, ear infection is a huge reason for these visits. And five out of six kids have an ear infection by the time they're three years old. Uh, so what does that really mean? And why does it matter? It's 50 million office visits specifically for ear infections each year in the US. So that's a lot, a lot, a lot of volume specifically for this disease. It's one of the highest reasons for office visits. It's the highest in kids, one of the highest in healthcare. Million surgeries annually for this. So when you have chronic ear infections, eventually you'll end up in an EMT's uh, office for in surgery. And the surgery for that is basically cutting a hole in your eardrum and sticking in a grommet or a ventilation tube, which, uh, which basically ventilates that middle ear uh, and, and is a pretty good intervention. There's a ton of these surgeries done, a million surgeries annually in the US, most common reason for kids to get surgery. Uh, they are under general anesthesia and all the associated risk with that. Nobody likes to go in and sign the form that says your kid might die because there is a risk with anesthesia being fully under, but that could happen. <laughs> It's the number one reason for antibiotics, uh, antibiotic use and overuse. It's one of the most common reasons that antibiotics are overprescribed, and uh, the CDC lists it on their website for that reason. It's the number one reason for hearing loss in kids. So there's a lot of real bad stuff that comes from uh, you know chronic ear infections and the prevalence of ear infections as a diagnosis in this country. We spend a lot of money on it in a variety of ways. Uh, it adds up to about ten billion dollars annually. Now, why did I get into this? I mentioned a little bit about my background, but I didn't mention I'm an engineer, but I'm also a father of three kids, uh, Eleanor, Jack, Sawyer. All of them have had really rotten times with ear infections, uh, and that's, that's really kind of a lot of the reason why I got into this. Jack, my oldest there in the middle, he was going through his first year of life around the time that I was working on this tech in the, uh, in the uh, lab, and uh, you know, I had 10 office visits and eight rounds of antibiotics, and, a referral to surgery all within his first year. So really got to live this out as parents. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, it looks a lot like this. This is the same as uh, Eleanor. Um, you know, I saw this again over Christmas, so it's not like it, it completely stops at any point. It gets uh, it more infrequent as they get older, but uh, this is really a, a very common scene uh, for any parents. You guys see a lot of shaking head, I'm sure she's seen plenty of these. So, what's the challenge for parents here? Because parents are a big stakeholder of ours. A 50% misdiagnosis rate when you walk into that office. So, you take your kid in, they're going to look with an otoscope. What they don't tell you is that there's only 50% chance that I'm going to be right when I make this diagnosis. Obviously, that's not good marketing. They're not going to come out with that one. But if you look at the published studies about otoscopes in primary care, that's the, that's the stat. That's what leads to tube surgeries being one of the most overused procedures in U.S. medicine. Now, why does that matter? One, it matters because, you know, we don't want to put kids under full anesthesia that don't need to be there. Uh, we really don't want to waste unnecessary health care costs. The payers, insurance, care a lot about that. They spend about $5 billion a year on this surgery. 
Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of potential ways to cost here. What's the challenge for clinicians? Uh, they're currently using 150-year-old technology that gets it wrong half the time. That's the, the summary of their problem. So it basically is a magnifying glass and a pin light. It's a otoscope with just a lens and a, an LED. You know, the biggest innovation that's happened in otoscopes over the last 150 years was moving, moving from a halogen bulb to an LED. So that gives you some perspective on, uh, on, on the innovation in this space. So this is what they see. They see a picture. They don't even see a picture, really. It's, a, it's analog most of the time. But they see uh, a, an image of the surface of the eardrum. And they have to figure out from that image what's going on behind it. So you can imagine a shower curtain that's, you know, translucent, maybe opaque, and you're asked to tell what color the person's eyes are on the other side of it. Uh, it's kind of a silly proposition. It's a similar situation here. That's a red eardrum. We can say that. What does that mean? It at least means that there's some inflammation. Maybe the kid was screaming in the waiting room the last 10 minutes. I know that rarely happens, but that would lead to uh, in, you know, an inflamed eardrum. So what do you do then? It doesn't mean there's, there's fluid behind it. So what we do, we provide them this image, but then we also look through the eardrum, and we can provide them this image, which looks a lot like ultrasounds. Uh, we use light to generate these images. That ribbon is the eardrum. Everything above it is the ear canal space outside the ear, and everything on the inside is, is the middle ear space. I don't know how it does work, and it's green, all of that. I, I can't see the red ones very well. Can't see it when it goes. Can anybody see it when it goes on that screen? Ah, okay. Wow, you guys need to think about this one. Back when you had a projector, this worked. It's a narrow claw. Okay. The opportunity to do yeah, innovation there. Somebody, it could, be a, it could be a laser pointer that works on a screen. Yep. All right, so, so that middle ear space right there, that's the money shot. That's what they need to see that they can't see today. Uh, it's full of air in that case. How do we know it's full of air? Because air is black in our images. Uh, if it's not here, it will not be black. So it's pretty straightforward. So what happens if there's fluid behind it? We'd see something like this, where you see that same eardrum, still a ribbon, but behind it, you see all of this gunk. You see this signal that corresponds to fluid in the middle ear. It's very easy to tell if something's black or if it's not black. So that's the, uh, that's the advantage of this technology, rather than having to examine, you know, how red is it? Is it, is it opaque? Is it translucent? Is there some other coloration? Is it bulging? All this stuff from a single image, um, let's just look behind it and tell what it's there. Uh, a little few more images here. This isn't really uh, all that interesting. The only point I'll make, we also can tell what type of fluid it is. So if it's clear fluid, which we would not treat with antibiotics, or if it's full of pus, which we would treat with antibiotics. First time any device has been able to do that. Um, so, so that's a big advantage for us as well. So what are some product features? We provide that high quality video otoscope that they're, the, you know, the view that they're used to seeing, and we do it in a digital way. All of this is shareable, saveable, printable. We can send stuff to the, you know, their network drives. We can send stuff to EMR. We can, we're working on cloud and got to rely on as well. It's all real time because they make their decisions about antibiotics in real time. So we have to provide immediate output. We can characterize fluid. First technology to be able to do that. We have FDA claims specifically around that. We don't use air pressure. And why is that important? Because essentially all of our competitors do. And the market in primary care has firmly rejected any technology that has to use pressure in order to assess a sensitive, painful ear. And it works even in significant earwax. If I, I, I thought about bringing advice today, I wasn't sure if we'd really have time, but uh, it's, it's always fun watching people's reaction to what their ears look like, not even the inside, just the outside with all the earwax. People freak out about earwax. It's really funny, but it's a big problem. So we. We don't really care about it. If it's completely impacted, then we still have to clean it out, but we've shown the FDA data that even if we're 95% you know, blocked, we can still uh, hit that eardrum and tell what's behind it. So where are we today? We got the FDA clearance uh, back just before the pandemic started, kind of put the brakes on, shifted our priorities because we knew that the, the market fundamentally changed for a period of time. Uh, you know, raised some money in late 2020 uh, and really started a uh, no cost, Let's learn pilot in January 2021. And you know, we really approached this pretty slowly. We didn't scale because we didn't want to burn money when a market was still trying to recover. So we put up um, you know 15 units, handpicked partners in January 2021, and uh, learned as much as we could over the next eight months. And that was incredibly valuable. We made all kinds of changes to product around our consumable, around our software workflow, around 
how we uh, we put the device into the offices, um, you know, battery consideration, all these things that we learned from customers. So that was all very beneficial. We published a semi-patient clinical trial, very good results from that, that that I'll share in a moment. And one of the unique things about us as a healthcare startup, and I don't know how many how many health tech we may or may not have in the audience here. Um, Reimbursement is is usually the gorilla in the room. You know, ten years ago, FDA was was the big monster, but uh, that changed, and FDA is not not totally unreasonable to work with. And now, when you're talking to a VC, they're not going to ask you what's the risk associated with your regulatory strategy. They're going to ask you what are the economics around this to your customer? How is it going to get paid? Is it going to cost them more? Because usually, it's going to fail if it costs them more. That's just the healthcare system we live in today. Uh, Patient care is great, everybody wants it, but not at the expense that, you know, of, of additional costs. So, we went out and got our own reimbursement codes. This was like a four-year process that we started very early. Most startups in the healthcare space wait until they get their FDA approval, and then they start looking at reimbursement. The problem with that is that now you're on the market, but you've got four years to go before you can really make progress on the reimbursement side. So that was something that I, I always attribute to one of our very first investors, named Andrew Thorence, he's out of Chicago. He was the... Uh, the director of reimbursement at Allergan. I'm sure I met him in some way through Enterprise Works, probably some association with the Chicago folks up there. And, uh, and he, he really focused us early on on making sure that we focus on reimbursement, and that's really big dividends. It's a huge uh, barrier to entry for other technologies in this space, and uh, it, it provides us uh, a really nice ROI for our customers. Clinical study results, I won't take a little deep here, but we had very good results. 91% sensitivity, 90% specificity. Uh, this is compared to surgery, so we just pulled the fluid out and compared directly. Uh, otoscope, the same thing, about 50%. So nice, uh, nice delta there as far as what we're providing. Our biggest competitive advantage were the only technology actually looking at the disease, which sounds silly, but all of the other technologies measure the eardrum. They either look at the surface of the eardrum or they measure mechanics of the eardrum. And the eardrum is not sick. The eardrum's not infected, the middle ear is infected. So how do we figure out what's directly in the middle ear? We just image the fluid directly. We're the only technology actually looking in the middle ear. The big opportunity, you know, it's uh, pediatrics are sometimes thought to be small opportunities in medicine. Uh, we are an exception there, because this is a ubiquitous problem that uh, does cost a lot of money. Uh, outside the US, we've got some, some strategies in other countries. We do have a distribution deal in Japan, but uh, uh, if, you know, other than that, we're really focused on the U.S. first. Um, if you go to market strategy, we hired two reps. That was the first, uh, you know, hiring and and you know, learning how to manage reps is a really interesting part of your growth as as a startup founder. Uh, that's you know, kind of industry agnostic, and, and uh, that's something that we we kicked off in I guess September and um, had some some really good folks on the team. We've got one in Texas, one in uh, Michigan. Uh, Future years, we're not scaling a direct sales team. We'll be uh, working with partners, distributors. Uh, that's kind of the way most of primary care is, is delivered. So you've heard names like Medline or Henry Shine or Well Channel and these big channels that we'll partner with moving forward. I mentioned earlier our Trailblazer program. We kicked it off in the beginning of 21. It was really handpicking and learning as much as we could from a few placements. Shifted that into phase two when we hired the reps, really looked to ramp our placements up and really get some commercial traction. Uh, that worked really pretty well. We, we pretty much uh, doubled all of our metrics in uh, Q4 compared to the previous three quarters in blind. So the, the reps were very uh, successful there and that's been a nice model for us to scale. We currently got about almost 50 devices in the field, you know, 130 or so users. Uh, we just crossed the 3,000 exam mark. Uh, most of that in Q4, so nice, nice traction over the last quarter. Here's just some of those, those kind of showing the trends in Q4, picking up those metrics. Reimbursement, really, still a really important part for us. It's uh, We've done a lot of the groundwork, but there's still a lot of we need from our customers as far as utilization, building these codes, working with our team when those codes get denied so we can appeal them. It's a whole thing. I mean, you could, you know, reimbursement is incredibly complicated, and you know, when when people ask me about the things that I might do differently next time around, uh, I would I would think very carefully about uh, you know starting reimbursement from scratch. It has been a, a bear, but I think it's also a huge barrier to entry. So you know it goes both ways. We're averaging about eighty one dollars every time uh, the exam gets paid, which is actually really strong. Uh, this is compared to when they use their scope, they get paid zero. There is no way to make any revenue with an scope. 
So that's one of our competitive advantages there. This is all brand new revenue stream to them. Uh, they've got covered reimbursement, and we let's talk a little bit about the process we wanted to get it. We had to get full support from the Academy of you know, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Roller Neurology, all of these large institutions that you really have to get on board in order to even get the codes established, much less the rest of the process to get them uh, moved forward. We're on Medicare fee schedules up to about $170, depending on the geography. Talked a little bit about the team earlier. I'll highlight some other people. Uh, 2020, after our Series A, we brought on Jeff Iyer, Chief Commercial Officer. Quick aside on the uh, on kind of the entrepreneurial front, there are, are two um, there, there are two strategies for rolling out commercially that I've seen utilized uh, from a staffing perspective. And you know, I chose one of them. Uh, I've been very happy with that choice, but I see both of them working well. The first one is what I did, which is hire somebody who really knows what they're doing, has been around the block, is not going to be a rep for the next five years. They're going to build a team, but they can serve as an early rep. That was Jeff, and uh, the nice thing about that, I mean, the downside is it's more expensive. You're going to pay a lot more for that person than you are a rep off the street. But um, I didn't know anything about selling stuff, so you know I had to fill that gap somewhere, and this was a good way for me to do it to make sure I made less mistakes in rolling that out if I was managing reps. I would have made so many mistakes that I'm sure didn't get made because we brought somebody in that knew what they were doing there. So that worked well for me. People that uh, may come from a sales background or have some of that experience, I think it, it, I've seen some very efficient models where the founder themselves will manage a rep or two reps and build it that way and eventually backfill a management role in that organization. Angela McFarland is local. She's out here. Uh, she's she's probably she maybe worked with somebody in the room. She works with a lot of startups around here. Alex Forward, we brought him in from uh, Connected Medical Device Space, specifically in primary care. It's kind of a perfect fit for us, brought him in last year. I won't go too much on our board. Uh, we have, uh, so the, the former SVP, Biz Dev, Walt Allen, Don Soderberg on our board. He's been a huge help. Um, he's married to one of the Allen daughters, and you know, you keep hearing Walt Allen. The reason for that is they own about 85% of the US market for frontline diagnostics. It is the gorilla in the room. Uh, they were just acquired by Baxter in, uh, in uh, December. Technically, their their parent company was brought up Baxter, but a lot of it was driven by their frontline uh, assets and, and home care. So, really good relationships into that area. Gary Durick, another local guy, uh, founded iSight. Um, he's he also founded Techno and, and has a lot of roots here. Fantastic guy. If you ever get a chance to work with him or take money from him, I fully recommend you do it. <coughs> Advisory board, you know, some. some Big clinicians, uh, as you would expect, but then just recently brought on Steve Meyer, the former Wilton CEO of Old John, really further establishing our, our uh, you know, expertise in the space. Talked about ears, but we can point this at any tissue and image into that tissue. So there's opportunities in the eye, dental, skin, a lot of places we can go from there. Uh, I crossed this out, and apparently my my uh, my. Animation to messed up. I just wanted to make clear this is not solicitation. So if you're credited, you can come talk to me later. But I'm not asking you to invest money right now. Uh, Alan probably appreciates that. Uh, so we are we are raising money right now, though. Um, Four million dollar no rounds. Really, it's a fully leveraged kind of attraction that we saw in Q4. Uh, really build up our commercial traction before raising the larger rounds at our Series B in first quarter 2023. Um, you know, we expect to be probably in the 1.5 million. That point, uh, which you may think that multiple sounds crazy, but the reason it does is because we're providing a completely new revenue stream. This is something that they don't have to pay for. In fact, they get paid for, and they can get paid quite a bit for. So there's a multiple there that's based off of the novelty we have in our customer economics that will be able to drive that. Raise some money from various people, a lot of locals to here, a lot of people in Chicago. Um, Took some money from Sony in our last round, which was kind of cool. Had that kind of consumer electronics uh, focus. OSF, which is just down the road from here, they uh, they participated in our last round. Uh, they did this one, and then uh, NIH. We raised a bunch of NIH money. You know, about eight million so far. We've got about four million under review. So that's something that you know, if I can stand on my NIH soapbox for a minute. Um, any of those government agencies, fantastic. The one pitfall that everybody needs to be careful about. If it doesn't fit into your product roadmap, be very, very, very careful about pursuing it. These things can be extremely distracting. We decided early on we would not be submitting anything that did not fit directly. If VC wouldn't fund it, then I'm not going to submit a grant for it. 
So that's pretty much it. Uh, one other topic I want to cover is like challenges, right? We always like to talk about challenges as a, as a startup. And you know, I was talking a little bit with Laura about this before we talk. COVID has been our number one challenge over the last two years. I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. Um, in our industry, there were uh, winners and losers when it comes to COVID, right? There's some medical device and medical supply companies that had exploded as a result of the COVID. This plot you see on here is actually a, a running plot from about 20, uh, early 2019, maybe 2018, um, to last month on number of ear infections in the US healthcare system. So you see, I'm just gonna show up above here. So you guys just, you know, imagine that green dot's down another three feet. So, so this, this drastic drop right here, obviously that's, you know, April, 2020, that's when the world fell apart. Uh, our, our, literally, our, our problem disappeared. Our problem disappeared. So it's not like, oh, there's an access problem. Oh, all the hospitals are shut down, so we can't get in. Yes, that was true. But also our problem disappeared. It was gone. It was a 90% drop in ear infections over the course of one month. It was insane. And we did not anticipate that. So that, that, has, been, that has been something that we're trying to work through. And you can see it's not recovered yet. It's, it's improving. And we are learning to deal with it better. But you know, it was pretty much flat for the first year of COVID. Um, the, the second year of COVID, you see this, you know, it's increasing back up. We got almost to this kind of sinusoidal wave you see before the pandemic that's actually seasonal. So in the summer, there's less ear infections. Less, you know, it's basically the flu season. So, uh, so anyways, slowly building back up, you see we get to Omicron and it takes again. Now, Omicron, fortunately, uh, if you look at any of the plots, I mean, it's like an impulse function, right? It's straight up, straight down. So that's gonna recover quickly and we'll continue this. And actually by the time we get to the end of this year, it's expected we're gonna have a flu season like none we've ever seen before because we've been building immunity debts by not getting sick. So, you know, this is, a, this is to some extent a little bit of a holding game for us. We've had to figure out how to get through this rather difficult problem of the market disappearing uh, and then be prepared whenever the opportunity starts to ramp again, which it's doing now. So anyway, um, that's all the slides I have. I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about, you know, entrepreneur stuff. If anybody has questions about, you know, how I got started or, or you know, team building, anything. Um, you had some really great data in there about your market. Like, what, did you learn all that in I Corps? Like, where, how, how did you go about researching? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question about uh, market, about uh, you know, how you get some of the market data, how you lay out the market when you're telling the story, that type of thing. Uh, I like to do it two ways, and I'm not unique in this. So you've got kind of a top-down approach, which is, you know, how many ear infections are there? How much does the healthcare system spend on ear infections? That helps frame the problem in the opportunity space. But then, you know, when you're looking at, you know, how do I size the market for revenue projection? I prefer to go bottom-up. So you look at, you know, how many potential placements do we have in the US, which is about 100,000, because of, you know, if you look at the number of, of clinics that exist in, in family practice, and pediatrics, and ENT, you know, urgent care, all of our potential market segments, uh, kind of add those together, then you have the kind of market size there, and then plugging the pricing model, and that gives you, uh, you know, both the revenue build over time, but also a total kind of steady state market opportunity. So that's that's the way that, uh, that, that I like to look at it. I think the top down is really to, Sanity check, your bottom up in, in, in the, the way that I kind of like to lay it out because I think bottom up is a lot more practical from like an operations perspective. But if the top down doesn't match up, then you need to figure out why. But is, is that the right direction? And, and you you did this yourself? Did you have the, your business guy help, or how did you, how did you, did you have some training? How did you know how to do that? Or yeah, to your point, I think a lot of my education around that came through i uh, They focused quite a bit on, on the whole, you know, Tam, Sam, Tom. Uh, it, I don't use those. I don't really like them either, but they're very good for educational purposes. So, uh, so yeah, there was a lot that I, I learned through that. And then bringing in people that had actually applied that in a real sense, like Jeff, uh, it helps to provide context. Yeah. Um, just I'm wondering, like, Um, I recently now we're now we're experienced uh, and people face a big problem, but they really fall on all solutions, what they have, how they do 
he said something new, they really to embrace new things is uh, is hard. So I'm just wondering in, in your area, do you find this reaction and how you overcome I think the uh, you mentioned the uh, reverse may help but do you find this uh, this behavior or how you are able to overcome? Yeah no, that's a great question and, and very applicable. I mean uh, there, there, there are pros and cons to approaching a solution that's been entrenched for 150 years, right? But the pros of that, it probably sucks. Um, the cons are that they've been doing it for so long that they kind of have really good reasons to change what they're doing. So yeah, this is absolutely something that we had to tackle. Um, it's still having to tackle. I have to tackle every day. I mean, I, my, my, my sales reps could talk about this forever because they face it every single day. And you know, the way we approach it, you really have to understand why they're why they're hesitant. And for us, you know, if you dig in, um, there's, there's, there's financial pushback, but we kind of tackle that with the, the uh, reimbursement fees. We actually, our pricing model is completely risk-free to our customers. We, we charge 500 bucks a month, but if they don't make that back in reimbursement, we credit the difference. So there's literally no financial risk there. So then, you know, it's still pushed back. Okay, it's, it's effectively free for you. Why are you pushing back? Uh, it's usually work plug. And in primary care, if they need to see, you know, each doctor's got to see 35 patients a day, they take one extra minute every exam, that wrecks, wrecks their entire day. So we had to really, you know, first understand that, and we did that through customer discovery. You know, what are, what, what are the biggest challenges for you, uh, you know, adopting a new te technology, and then, and then why, and why, and why, and understanding what is it that's actually driving your hesitation around this? And once you do understand it, you understand that, oh, I can't take any more of your time. Or if I do, I better have some real strong value to provide you. And uh, you know, going from there. So then we focused our efforts very strongly early in development on how do we ensure that we don't push the workflow? How do we make sure we're replacing something they're currently doing? So we get that time, but that thing we're doing, we can take that. And then how do we make sure we don't add to that time? Or if we do, we have really compelling reasons for doing so. So that's that's kind of the way we approach it. It's all about fully understanding where that pushback is coming from. Okay. Oh. In terms of your FDA approval process, uh, how did you approach it between the kind of company working on things, outside consultants, and uh, what were the best things you did, and what if anything did you regret? Yeah, great question. So, the you know, question was, how did we kind of strategize our own FDA in terms of what resources we used, and what would we do differently, what did we do well. Um, so we, we were actually, one thing I'm very proud of, we, we got our FDA approval with less than $3 million raised, which for medical devices is actually quite good for 510K. We were extremely capital efficient. This was before our series A round. And um, the biggest thing that helped us was I used the crap out of the, the Pre-segregation. Um, the FDA has paths that allow you to talk to your, the people who are going to be reviewing your application. And before the world blew up, you could do that in person, and that was huge. Like we went there, those for demo days. Like FDA used to, they would do these demo days where you could actually bring in and set up like an exhibition hall, and random FDA people would come out of their office and, and play with your stuff, and that was really cool. So we were actually able to image the ears of every one of our reviewers prior to them even seeing our application. And there is no better way to understand technology than how to use them. So that was that was incredibly helpful. And, and I know that that's not super helpful because today you can't do that. You will be able to do that. Things will get back to normal. But that was incredibly helpful. As far as uh, consultants, we did use consultants. We did not have any internal FDA experience, really. We had you know some internal knowledge, but none of us had actually taken a product to the FDA. So we did. Uh, the next Phillips guy in the imaging space, um, probably you know, on external consultants for FDA, it was probably fifteen, twenty grand, something like that. It wasn't crazy. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So this is a class two device, then. It is, yes. It is class two, five ten k path. We did have a little bit of a unique 510K, so generally speaking, the whole point of a 510K is to point to something else and say, I want that. So give me those claims, and I'll show that I'm the same as that. When you're developing brand new, never seen before technology, it doesn't really fit real well with that concept, but 
they loosen that concept a little bit and you can add clinical data and say, I'm kind of close to that, but here's some clinical data to really prove that I am uh, for us and show safety and efficacy and things. So we did that. We actually brought quite a bit of clinical data to our 510K, which is a little unusual. Usually they just do bench studies to show events and it's like that thing. Yeah. Uh, but bringing that extra data really helps us get some unique claims. So. We're actually hearing this in our own pre-submission the next week. Um, I was wondering, um, it sounds like after you got your clearance, you went out and got more data and you're talking about making some changes to the device. Are you going to have to do a revision then at some point? Yeah, good question. So some things that we do, we can do internally with layer file, which layer file is basically just stating in my documentation that I changed something and this is why it didn't change the risk profile of my device. Uh, other things, um, the FDA lays out fairly, fairly in clear guidance around what triggers a new submission. And for example, we are in the middle of implementing a, a battery, uh, kind of integrated battery in the device. First, first prototype didn't have one, we just kind of uh, keep it plugged in. Uh, obviously for workflow reasons in the, in the clinic, it's helpful to have that battery, so we're doing that project now. That requires a new 510K. Uh, now, a new 510K, it can be a special 510K pack, yeah. uh, which, which is expedited, but still requires you to go with an application to the FDA. So it depends on what you're doing. If, if you're doing machine learning and it's not purely for ease of use, you pretty much got a 510K minimum, usually in de novo uh, online. So it really depends. Sure. Thank you. All right. Ryan, you got your PhD, you have postdoc, you have a young family, and being an entrepreneur is tough and it's risky. And it's hard to know whether you're still going to be around. How did you stay the course and feel like you were balancing that with what uh, you needed to do for your own family as well? Mostly ignorance. Of <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't know. What, I didn't know what you know professional life looked like. So that helped. But basically, um, I mean, one, I have a super, uh, super supportive wife. Uh, my wife is, is totally supportive of all of this stuff. Starting companies and, and, and um, I think one thing that does help founding a company out of an academic path is if you're coming out of grad school or you're coming out of postdoc, you're not making much money anyway. So the bar to get started is a lot lower. Whereas you know if you're working in industry for five years and so now you're making 150 k and have a nice pension and now you got to stop doing that so you can scrape by on 25, that's way harder. So um, I think that's one of the pros. Obvious con for starting out of school is that you don't know anything. So you don't have the experiences that you would get from five years in industry. So it's a trade-off. Uh, if you choose to do it early, which is probably still my preference even after doing it that way, uh, you've got to leverage the crowd out of mentors. You've got to learn the stuff you don't know. And that is what uh, determines a good entrepreneur from bad one. It's literally how much you can learn from other people. Uh, because that is, that is what makes and breaks you know, success. In this industry. Probably got a little off topic there, but I'll go with uh, maybe as we're wrapping up. But you had a lot of mentors and people. What are some of the best advice that you received from people in areas that were perhaps different fields than yours? Oh man, yeah, that's a really long list. Some stuff that might stick out to me. Um, I mean, a, a recent one that's maybe maybe a little bit contentious, like. Don't don't over function on what other people think, even if they're on a cap table. Like you gotta be respectful. You gotta you gotta use other people's money with respect and discipline. But you also have to be extremely efficient with your time, and you have to make decisions decisively. And being entrepreneurs, myself included, for many years, um, can listen to everything. And it's not that you shouldn't listen to everything. You can listen to everything. Well, it doesn't take too much of your time, but you, you learn to filter quickly. You know, you, you get all this information from everybody, whether it's a mentor, all of them, you know, 99% of it is, is good, good work. Uh, but your key job as a CEO is to take all of that information and to split it down to, you know, the decisions you need to make. And it's very easy to get distracted. It's very easy to burn a ton of time listening to and writing about all these things that so that was one that that uh, was very important. I think you know another one is just ultra focus on team. Like uh, uh, 
that's when the lots of people say it, but uh, you just really, your, your, your value is in your team. If you don't have a good team, then you really don't have an opportunity. So, you know, invest where you're gonna get the best return and you're gonna get the best return on your team because what if the product's wrong? Well, you can switch. What if your team's wrong? That's pretty much it, right? Start over. So that's uh, that's what to stick out to me the most. Hey Rob. Yeah. You're now a pretty distributed uh, company. I know you've got a couple of different options. How how are you adapting to that? And how do you address that in the rest of the situation? Great question. So the question was, uh, you're, you're somewhat distributed now. You've got a couple different offices, people in various places. Um, how do you navigate that? And this is something that I've actually spent thinking about this. So a little bit of history, founded the company here in Enterprise Works. We bounced around in probably four different offices around here. Uh, eventually had like both of these, which is pretty cool. They're like right in the center. Um, thank you. No blood, blood. Um, and then in 2020, after we raised, well, actually, no, before that, 2019, we, uh, we moved over into uh, off of Fox Drive. Needed some more space, needed to build out some manufacturing. So we went over there. Uh, and then 2020 came along, the world fell apart. Um, you know, we raised some money, like I mentioned before, kind of cutting the, cutting the deal in half and getting it close quickly. Um, as part of that, we, uh, we needed to make some hires that, that we weren't able to do here. There was some, some technical expertise we needed, and the best place to get that at the time was Raleigh Durham. So we opened an office in Durham. And so that was kind of our first expansion. So we've got offices here, we've got offices in Durham. Um, in 2021, early 2021, I made the choice to move to Arkansas. So I actually live about a mile from Walmart's headquarters uh, in Dentonville, Arkansas. And I don't know, it, Laura, Laura will vouch for me. It's a cool place. I, I know it's Arkansas and there's lots of pretty deep questions about Arkansas. But <laughs> take a look. The Waltons have, have just been hell-bent to make sure that place is amazing. So come check it out sometime. Um, so I moved down there mostly for family reasons. Uh, my, I, my wife needed more local support and we didn't have any of that up here. Uh, there's some health things going on too. So, you know, I told my board, look, I'm, I know it's not ideal, but I'm going to be a better CEO in Arkansas. So, what do you guys, what do you guys think? And they were very supportive. They said, you know, we, we trust you and you can do what you want. And uh, so, I moved to Denver, Arkansas. I spend usually a week, a month in Raleigh Drum. So, I have to, you know, travel a decent bit, but that's a little different than your regular CEO life, right? Um, as far as how we manage it now, because we also got now someone in Texas, someone in, in Michigan, on the other side of the reps. Um, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. And I, I, recently, I, I recently listened to this talk from, from this entrepreneur. It was actually the founder of, uh, of um, Evernote. Evernote. Um, and he's, he lives like a mile from me in Bentonville. And uh, he's got this new company that's super cool. You have to check it out, it's called Mm -hmm. Spelled the way you would think, like, like M M H M M uh, dot com. It's a really neat uh, platform for basically making these meetings uh, more fun and streamlined. It's super cool. But he's got a lot of thoughts around distributed workforce communication, and he's got this cool slide. I should have included it. It's basically a, a, a Trump's pyramid, and like the bottom half of the pyramid is recorded video. Then there's a little section above it that is synchronous video. And then there's a little bit section at the top that is live in person. And this is the way that he chooses to, to, to run his company. And that doesn't mean that there's not interaction. It means, and this is not from a, this is not about relationships. This is about communication. So what he's saying is that 50% of all of our communications amongst our team should be delivered in communicated, you know, recorded video format. It should be consumed, right? It's the most efficient way to deliver half of the information you have to convey. The next section, you know, we do have to get on some live meetings sometimes and they're distributed, so we can't do that in person. Uh, let's make sure that that is extremely effective time. It's smaller in the pyramid. And then, of course, the live in person, will bring its team in. They'll, they'll do a retreat in Bentonville or they'll go somewhere else, right? And that needs to be like the most valuable time. Uh, and, and just a little bit of it at the top, but it's very high impact. So I'm rethinking around that because, you know, the world's completely changed with respect to. Teams, distributed teams, VCs no longer care if you're located in Silicon Valley. They don't really care where you are. If you, if you can show that you can execute in a distributed way, nobody cares anymore. So I think it's something everybody should be thinking about because um, 
Your hiring pool basically just went from where you are to the entire world. So it's something to think about and, and not be too hesitant about pulling on you know, distributed team. Thanks everyone, thanks for being a great audience. Thank you to Ryan.